uh, Stacy and Kevin. So happy to have you guys here uh, on our show here for the Beat Poor uh, Black History Month residency. It's a shame they can only get us together for Black History Month, but you know how they how it is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys so much to uh, come on the show and uh, talk with us about Detroit and our history. Um, Kevin, we've known each other for a little bit. Stacy, we've met each other a few times over the years. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you guys. How you guys doing today? All righty, doing good, doing good. Doing well, doing well. Yeah. It's really unfortunate we're not able to have Al Esther here today. He's uh, He seems to have caught, caught in the flu. But what I really wanna talk to you guys out about, and this is why I was really wanting to get Al here, is uh, the real story of Detroit. You know, being from Detroit and, you know, I used to work at Melodies and Memories. You hear that every other person had a different story of what really happened, you know. And Al and I know Stacy, you guys played down at Cheeks there. And uh, you had the Stacy, you had the radio show forever. Um, Kevin, everybody knows your story with Detroit techno and, and the kind of invention of techno music. But I want to bring and shed some light to the kind of unknown story of Detroit. And that's kind of the house story and the story that was happening in Detroit pre techno. Um, Stacy, why don't maybe you can uh, give um, some of our viewers a little bit of, of your background and history before we jump into all of this. I think it'd be lovely for them to hear from you. I mean, you've always been a source of inspiration for me and so many Detroiters, but for uh, the international crowd tuning in, I just wanted to get to know you a little bit. Well, it's best for you to ask me a direct question because I've been around so long, I don't know where to start. You know, because there's so many things. I can start with this picture right over. Let's see, this way right there. That was actually taken at Cheeks. And that's the thing I used for the godmother. Wow. That, that was actually taken in, um, you know, we would drive up the alley and it was a garage back there. And this photographer, Joycelyn Goins, took that picture. Little did I know that it would breathe so much life. And actually, it's, you know, part of my local. So for many of our viewers, they may not know, but Stacy is the godmother of house music, of Detroit house music, Detroit dance scene. Uh, had a radio show on many different stations uh, growing up or throughout throughout the time of the kind of the history of the whole uh, the whole story of Detroit dance music. Um, and uh, yeah, so so many people, Kevin, we know the story of the Bellevue Three. We've heard 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 those tales before. I know you and Stacy have been friends for a very long time. So that's correct, right? Oh yeah. Yes. I knew Kevin before. Kevin knew Kevin and, and was embracing <laughs> all this change, you know. One of my fondest memories is um, him coming to the the pub over there on Milwaukee or wherever it was. And he bought me my two test pressings of uh, big fun. Wow. And uh, oh. you know, this is before a Virgin picked him up. Right. Who was who, so? Who was DJing first then? Here I was. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely Stacy was DJing first. You know, I'm I, I came out of nowhere because nobody knew who I was. You know, I, I was around in the background, but I was up at Eastern Michigan. I'm from New York, and then I moved to Detroit, so I was kind of in the background because I knew Derek and Juan and went to school with him. I started, you know, making my way in, you know, and I was kind of the kind of cat that like. If I want to do something, I'm gonna find a way to do it. So, um, speaking of Al, I actually was going to Cheeks, and this I was going to Cheeks when I was at Easton before I became a DJ, you know. And then prior to that, I was going to places like the Paradise Garage. So I was getting all of this, this music and absorbing it, but people didn't know me in Detroit. Stacy didn't know me then, and all the people that was DJing before me didn't know. The, you know me, and then as I started making music and making my path through Juan and Derek, and and finding my own way, that's how we all started connecting. And, that's and how the connection happened, yeah, yeah. So was so then was Cheeks Detroit's first real dance club? Would we say? Um, it was the first club that got the notoriety for being playing house techno progressive music because it was no such thing at that time called house. Or techno, yeah, it was progressive. You guys called it progressive music. Oh, uh, progressive, and we yeah. would go to the eastern and, and, and the western, and we would, you know, play the music. But and uh, you know, I'd go over to Chicago and fill my car full of records, you know, from DJ International and from tracks. I'd load my car up and come back and play it. So I've been a rebel from day one. Um, 
just anxious and fast and able to play the different music. Well, I liked it, first of all. And uh, so, again, it wasn't even called house. I remember being uh, in Miami one time at the Winter Music Conference, and they always give away these awards and stuff uh, for best DJ, best promoter, best label, la, 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 all this stuff. And this DJ got up there and said, he was the one for best DJ, and he said, and I don't play house. And we, you know, some bunch of DJs and, you know, we started throwing shit at him. He's like, who do you think you, that's just how passe that was, you know, like house music, it's just, you know, not, I clearly identified. And Wow. Uh, but yeah. Is, what, so about what, what year was this? Um, this is in the eighties, um, between 80 and 85. Wow. This was happening. Yeah. So, you know, that was like, not cool to play house music. It's not cool. And then, you know, like the techno was on the horizon coming there. And so that was not cool. So I, I took advantage of my platform and I played it in the clubs and on the radio. I would sneak it in. I would always doing it. I didn't, you know. I love this. I love this, this, this real history and lesson. And that's exactly why Cheeks was so successful because they would come there and they hear music they couldn't hear anywhere else. Right. Nobody was playing it. They, did, they didn't know, you know, what it was. I never, and, and not even Jeff Mills, because he was more of a, a, you know, a scratcher, you know, like a soul sonic force and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Real quick. Uh, two, 10 seconds, five seconds, you know. In that's hour. right. And throw the record. That's right. Just do that. Just do that. So he wasn't playing house music. Yeah, yeah. But I was, and so was Alan. Yeah. Yeah, because Jeff Jeff was one of the first DJs at Cheeks, and I know Al had taken over for Jeff. Correct. After some time, oh, as oh, Jeff was oh, the wizard. That's that's not totally correct. Um, okay. The, okay. The first DJ, um, as we say, black DJ was John Collins. Right. John Collins, yeah, from Res right. from uh, Underground Resistance. Yes, John Collins was the first DJ there, and then Jeff was on Wednesdays, and I came in Rick because it was still the owner, the white owner was still there when they got John, and then when Marshall and Larry took over, they hired, they kept John and brought me on, okay. and so I, and so then Jeff was doing the Wednesday, and John and I were doing the weekends. Okay. Jeff left and then Alan came. Okay. And, um, you know, another, it was lots of memories, but one of the fond, another fond memory was uh, UBQ was big then, but they were all R&B, cameo, and everything that fall in that genre. And we were making so much noise over there. He took off work to come. He had to come here. What are y'all playing? What is going on? And, uh, That's you know, incredible. You know, how so music considered gay music it's like what <laughs> yeah so um where where uh, this is this was going to be a, a question for al because i know he had a, an affinity and a good relationship with ken collier but a lot of people in europe now are asking about where ken fit, uh, fits into this story maybe you guys could shed some shed some light on that you know i'm a bit too young for those days so i i wasn't able to to really experience that story as well well well, you know, being the senior here, I Paradise Garage, and I definitely know Kent, knew Ken very well. I knew Ken before Al knew Ken. Okay. Um, we were uh, very, very close. And uh, actually, Ken Collier is who taught me how to play records. So Ken Collier, in many ways, is the godfather or kind of a... He is a the godfather. He is, he is the man here in Detroit, as Larry LeVan is in New York, as Frankie Knuckles is to Chicago. No question, hands down. There's no and, question. And uh, Kevin, do you want to tell us a, a little bit about you, Derek Juan, and you know, and uh, and starting uh, and Eddie. <laughs> what? And Eddie, 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 folks, we oh, can't yeah. forget Eddie. We can't forget Eddie in in the in the story, and how you guys uh, started up doing the parties and. You know, I heard a lot of stories about how you guys, how it's like really high school crews back then, and you guys were doing like little um, no kind of no jit parties, and uh, it's like kind of like high school kind of balls almost. 
And then that's kind of where um, the sound and, and everything's originated. Could you go into that or tell us the real story, how everything went down and how this all fits together and the story of Detroit techno and house? <laughs> all right. So, so me and Derek and Juan, we knew each other in junior high. So we seventh grade. Now Juan was in ninth grade. Me and Derek was in seventh. I met Derek through uh, Juan's brother Aaron Atkins, and uh, me and Derek played sports, and and Aaron played sports. So we kind of met Juan just because we was hanging out with Aaron, and Juan was kind of his own world. He was already like out there and kind of in his, you know, he was deep, you know, but he didn't like really communicate with me at all. We we didn't have many conversations until the years progress but one already when i went to the house because we all lived in belleville you know within like whatever uh, a few miles from each other and when i went to to the house the first time i seen like electronic stuff i didn't really know what it was some of it was like a tracks and cassette decks and but multiple ones i was like why well, he got so many different little pieces and some old sense of what well, it was new then but i didn't really know what that was i didn't really pay attention but as time went on and Juan started creating Cybertron. That's when I started paying attention more to his music. Now that didn't happen like right away. That happened maybe two or three years later after, you know, seventh, tenth grade. Maybe Juan was already maybe a senior, you know, or something like that. So musically, I wasn't really connected to him musically, even though I was going back to New York. And as I got older, I was going to clubs and Paradise Garage and stuff like that. But Derek and him connected. And the way me and Derek connected is Derek moved in with me in 10th grade for the second half of, of the semester because his mother was moving back to Detroit. And when Derek moved in, my eyes opened up to more of what Juan was doing. I hung around Juan a little more and I found out about Mojo. So now like, I got this New York kind of kind of philosophy on music, didn't know about Mojo. And then eventually, uh, Mojo was playing Juan's record. So then I was like excited. I knew somebody had a record that was being played on, on the radio, you know, and I was getting educated by all this music. So one day, when I, all this music Mojo was playing, whether it was Kraftwerk, uh, uh, New Order, B-52s, Juan stuff, it was just a, a mixture, you know, of all this different music, uh, Prince, Parliament Funkadelic. But Derek convinced me one day to steal my mother's car and drive to Detroit. He was like, he was like, let's go to Detroit. Party. Juan is doing the party. It's his deep space party. So this is the beginning of deep space. And Juan's a senior. We're in 10th grade. We take the car, flying down to Detroit. Now, Derek, tell me he has a license. He shows me an ID, which later on, I found out that was just a state ID. So he tricked me, first of all. He wasn't even old enough to drive. But we made it there and made it back. And we went to a party. And that was my first experience that even seeing or knowing Juan DJ. So then that connection happened. Um, so as as I be, Derek moves back to Detroit, you know, I, I experienced all that. Derek moves back to Detroit uh, when the school semester is over. We don't really stay in contact that much because, you know, I'm playing sports, really. I'm more of an athlete. And Derek, we talk a little sports, but nothing really about music. Still following Mojo. Obviously, Juan is, uh, he, he's making music. I'm hearing it on the radio, all this stuff. Um, um, so what happens is we have a high school uh, graduation party at my house. My mother moves to Southfield. I have this big house in Belleville, like 4,000 square feet. Uh, I invite all these people, Juan and them invite people. Juan and Derek DJs this party. It's called Chocolate Sensations. It was like the black kids at my school, we all got together and created this organization like to, so we could just enjoy ourselves in our senior year. So we give this party and all these people from Detroit come, like from Cass, from here, from there, and people who were into progressive music at the time, because that's still what it was called, you know? Music, um, that's right. Smoking these, the germs, cigarettes, and just dress real cool, and just, but people had a great time. We had four levels to the house, and pool outside. It was a great party. The first time I seen Juan DJ, and then Derek was his, his protege. He was playing too. So that kind of was the, the, the way I came into it. As I went to school, to Eastern, uh, that after my senior year, Juan was doing his own thing. Juan was really in his own world. He wasn't thinking about us. He was like, now Derek was helping him with other stuff, like with Mojo and you know, records 
Jackson, what all kind of stuff. You know, I don't really know what's going on, and you know, with all that. But I know Derek is just like a like a sales guy for him, a promoter. You know, he's pushing wine, right? <laughs> and his and his records, and he's proud of them too. So in college, I get connected with uh, um, a guy named Art Payne and Keith Martin. And Derek hooks me up with them, tells me these guys are cool guys. You know, I was playing football. It wasn't working out. So I talked to Derek. He lived in Chicago. All of a sudden, I'm hanging out with these guys who are playing parties in on campus uh, at Eastern and playing <laughs> and music in the same kind of crowd. You know, it was like, like all blacks, progressive music, uh, and, and, and the music I'm loving. So, and I'm hearing, you hear wine stuff played in there always. You know, that was always a part of, of whoever was playing was playing something to wands, right? So I'm hanging out with them. I meet Eddie folks through them. That's how Eddie comes in the picture. So you, you met know? Eddie at Eddie up at uh, at Eastern Michigan. Eddie, Eddie, I met Eddie at Eastern because he go he ends up going to Eastern and he become he's he's actually playing. I meet these guys first. He's they're DJing, but then Eddie starts DJing and Eddie Eddie was vicious up to up at Eastern. He was a bad DJ to me. I was like, wow. You know, I seen Al. Al was sweet too. I don't know if I seen Stacy. I remember seeing Al for sure at that time. But um Eddie was like, I was like, damn, he can play. He, he was fearless up, up on the table. He's playing like the fraternity parties, though, in the, in the on the campus. He played like all the parties, the Kappas, the Alphas, whoever, right? So that really inspired me to say, I want to play these parties too. I want to learn how to DJ. So my inspiration for DJing, even, you know, it was a combination, seeing one of them back then, but seeing somebody I knew and seeing these guys around. And that's how uh, it, it went from that stage to wanting to DJ to eventually making music because I seen Derek and Eddie and starting to make music, I wanted to do it too. I believe like I, I had a love for the music, you know? So, and house music was starting to starting to come about as, you know, uh, the year started, uh, let me think, it was 82, 83, so 84, all that started to kick in, right? So I wanted to start making music. I was watching these guys and I was like, I'm gonna practice and practice. I actually went to a school in uh, Ohio and said, learn how to mix. It was like, a not really a school, it was more like a, a two day type of seminar type of thing. They teach you BPMs and all that. So I did all that, came back, practiced. Before I knew it, Derek moved back to, to uh, Detroit. I started hanging around him. He started having these drum machines and stuff. I started messing with him. Before I knew him, we all had, was messing with the equipment together. Now, we wouldn't mess with Juan. Juan kept away from all of us. He might let Derek come around and touch his stuff. But I learned. We kind of learned from each other, playing with each other. And Derek, myself, and Eddie, we were making, we were playing on the same equipment because Eddie lived with Derek uh for a while eddie lived with me for a while so that's how it all kind of started coming together from djs to mix shows to wanting to make do something different and it started with drum machines like just playing a drum machine at the party in your mix you know what i mean like just playing because at that time i felt like what i felt is music it was a void in it. This music was cool that I was listening to, some disco, some electro, uh, this progressive stuff, some stuff from Europe, but it didn't have what I thought that made it consistent and it needed to be minimized. And I think that's what we, we brought to the table as as Detroit, you know, be able to minimize it. And wine was really more or less, he was in his own world of music. He was he was in between kind of electro and techno, but he was techno because he, he 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 came up with the phrase and he had this vision. But at the time, me and Derek, I think our path was we were probably closer to the house because you know the four four and the flow consistency of people dancing. Um, but we all made this music together. Me, Derek, Eddie, Juan was ahead of us, of course, and Eddie record came out first. Because Juan wanted to come out first. Then Derek came out on Transmat. Juan helped Eddie. Juan helped Derek. Juan helped all of us with our first record. Juan came in the studio and showed me. I had all these parts. 
And I was like, well, okay, I got all these parts I done played and put together, but how do I bring it all together? You know, he showed me that. And once I knew, once I seen how to do that, that helped me take off. Cause then I was really like full throttle. You know, my first few collaborations, it was collaborations. And then I was really off on my own and, and started my company, just like Juan had Metroplex, Derek had Transmat, and we would just, I was a self-promoter, like Stacey say, I bought him my records. I would take DJ's records, Juan, records, Derek records. We were just all, we was excited about what we were doing. We loved and we knew we was on to something that was special, you know? And we got Chicago wow. right next door, too, you know? Wow, wow. Uh, so, yeah, and, and we really embraced that. Um, you know, the rivalry between Detroit and Chicago is that what were you saying? Yeah, but that, that this was the music, you know, overall, and 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 we realized you know, that the birth of techno and was coming, you know, right, you know, being homegrown, and even maybe not even understanding it, but just that rebel part in us, just you know, um, was yeah. to, to do that. But that, but but the house where where we were the biggest rebels um, when I competed with uh, 600 DJs at the Fox Theater in 85 and I won. Um, again, House wasn't popular, but one of the first tracks I put on there was uh, On and On by Jesse Saunders. Wow. Nobody ever heard it, but I just you know, I just insisted on doing that. Just so Stacy, tell us a little bit about the parallel, because Kevin and these guys, they're in school. They're, they're coming out of high school. Mm-hmm. And you were already DJing in the clubs. Um, I know uh, Delano, he, he was around in those early times as well. And so you guys, you guys were already playing in the clubs. And maybe there was a, maybe there's a divide or a, a parallel scene going on in Detroit uh, during the same time. Because Kevin's talking about coming to meet you and bring you the records and hype the records up. Can you tell me a, a bit about what you guys were doing and who was involved in that time as well? You know, there's Stacy, there's Mike. And I say, see, I'm sorry, there's Mike and Delano and Norm and all these guys. Where were they um, at this time? They, they're all, they were all after me. I used to play Delano's parties. And I remember the first time I saw his name on the flyer, I say, DJ, that was like shocking to me. I mean, you know, nothing, but, you know, I was playing his parties. It used to be a lot of uh, groups around uh, Agave, uh, that's how the Shari um, it was, you know, they would at the different high schools, they'd have these groups and they would have yeah. these parties and they would name, they would all have these Ambergard type names. And, um, yeah, you know, Shari Bar was a high school crew, correct? Correct. And yeah. just, you know, like in the world as it still is, you know, very male dominated. You know, that's just how it is. How, how it's been, yeah. yeah that, I mean, I wanted to get you on the show to tell you that your perspective. And, and so, even so I was a force to be reckoned with, but most male DJs didn't like it. They just, you know, for whatever reason. And, but they realized I was bringing the heat. So it wasn't because I was a female, but maybe because I was a female bringing the heat might, might work. You know, it kind of worked in a weird kind of way. Yeah. So, and so I just continued to kick down doors. And, I think more, more than anything, you've just been a bad DJ since day one. So <laughs> just just trying, you know, because I love music and just like Kevin, you know, my inspiration was my brother, uh, my brother Aaron. I, he had a wall of components and it just intrigued me, reel to reels, all this stuff. He wasn't a producer, he just loved music. But in the music that he loved, it 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 horned my skills because that's how I got to know about fusion. I got to know about rock. I got to know, you know, so I was always, you know, taking in, you know, different types of music. Uh, you know, the jazz, all that. I'm in a rock band. I'm in Jessica Caremore's Black Women Rock. It re- oh, and, and which is the full life. Ah, oh, God, I just love this shit. I'm telling you. <laughs> That's a Christy. <laughs> Stephanie's singing for Kevin now. You know, when this is the person to tell me, I hate how I had so many fights with her. I produced <laughs> songs for her. Like, I hate how this is long before she met Kevin. I said, I bet you don't say that. Man. <laughs> She is a singer. I'm a mess with her about that too. You really get I mean, we were in New York, and I mean, I mean, we like the Fed. I had big old fight because I'm trying to be at the house party. Now we're in New York doing Black Women Rock stuff, 
And so we finished doing all that. I want to go to the house party up in some low down joint, you know, doing what you know how to do. Under the car. And she wouldn't get out the car. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm house mm, music. <laughs> you know, she a kid, but oh, read. Mm -hmm. I, right now. I said, really? So this is how ironic how that come around and you know the, the the platform and stuff that she's on now. Yeah, it's it's funny how that that works. I want to ask you guys about another Detroit institution, um, the uh, Music Institute. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, I know Kevin, you were involved with the institute. Stacy, were you playing down there as well? And can you tell I, us? I, I, you I, played, I was never a resident. I did have an opportunity to grace the turntables again. The male dominated thing going on, but I was there, and and I danced and 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 I played and I, you know. Um, for, for for many of for many of our listeners, I don't know if they everybody know the music institute. For me, growing up, was always kind of uh, given this uh, this um, this place as kind of the home of where techno really You're took exactly it, right. where techno really took off. That's Kevin, can you, is is that true? And Kevin, can you tell us about the institute and and what it meant to the um, the foundations of Detroit techno and kind of it really taking that next step. Yeah, well, the Institute was, was uh, me and Derek originally, we were uh, the residents there. It started out with us on, uh, I think it was Saturday night, and Friday night was Chaz Mayer, uh, Alton uh, Miller. Alton Miller. Miller. Um, um, and it was owned by George Baker. It wasn't owned by me and Derek, it was owned by George Baker. Who was ahead? He was. He always been around the music. His, his uh, uncle, and he just took advice from Derek, from me, on what the club, you know, should be like, and what kind of sound. And you know, we still learning at that time too. But we had more vision than, than most of them, because uh, we experienced, you know, uh, at least I experienced Paradise Garage, the music box, uh, the warehouse. You know, just different venues outside of Detroit. So we're trying to just give that type of flavor for the, for our music. So um I opened up the 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 night for me and Derek. Derek actually had to fly to Europe. So I played the whole night. I mean you know I played the whole night. Um, um so it was just it was a great experience. Um for me I didn't get to play as much as I wanted because inner city took off. So and I started touring. So what happened is D Wynn came in and kind of took my place. And Derek and him was it was rolling, you know, uh, and it became this big thing with so many different DJs uh, and not DJs, but people from that weren't weren't necessarily DJs and just wanted to experience came in and heard Detroit music, heard house music, heard music that they couldn't hear, uh, and they heard it on a, on a mix show by one of us or Stacy, somebody playing at that time. Uh, to, to get the, uh, the real experience of how they should hear it and, and, and so, uh, open up at 12. And, and so that's true, but there was a club that did that before the Music Institute and it was in Heaven. Heaven. Heaven is where Ken Collier was playing, Heaven, right? Exactly. It was called Heaven. And that, well, that happened before the Music Institute. And here's a story that nobody knows and I, every bit of poor. I was actually the, the local, Heaven, um, Downstairs was a club called the Gas Station. It was a gay club. And right. upstairs was After Hour, white boy, gay club. And just as the blight and all that moving um, out, um, this one guy was a Jewish guy. He actually hired me to play Heaven. And he just kind of got killed. And they buried him and, you know, it happened so fast. And then um, uh, Tim, took over and needless to say that's what i mean by the the male female thing so, so i did the job and that's how ken ended up being the house person the dj at heaven but mad respect all of everybody would come there i remember Derek coming bringing his records there many times the only people he would ever let touch his turntables would be uh, melvin hill myself and his brother greg nobody else could play he just for whatever reason that's it. but saturday night we get off of be in the bar nine to two and we hit it to heaven and that's what we do, and I would bring. So in. heaven was a bit of an after hours, and the music after institute, hours, yes. music institute went late as well. Kevin, it yeah. started at twelve, and it went to whatever four or five, six, yeah. seven. Yeah, wow. 
Yeah. Yeah. Detroit's always been a late night city, even when I was growing I didn't up. Know, I didn't know there was a heaven. I knew there was a heaven, but the heaven I knew was after the Institute. So I didn't know there was a heaven. So that had existed before then. And then he must have moved location because the one I knew was on Eight Mile and Woodward area or something like that. Was that? No, no. Heaven's on Seven Mile and uh, Woodward. Seven, oh, mile. seven, seven mile and Woodward. Yeah. Right. Well, that's the, I mean, so well, I knew the right one because well, I was so, right. so, so Club Heaven, Detroit, Paradise Garage, New York, right? Warehouse, and Chicago. Chicago. All that was going on at the same time. Wow. I didn't know that, that was around at the time. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was a thing. We break you guys. Up. And so, of course, yeah. I would hang out with all the guys. It, 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 all it was was men DJs, okay? So we right. get so I'd run with the boys and I'd be and we get off our jobs and we hit it. We go over there. Frankie Knuckles played it. No, that's Lumo. That was when Lumo came in after heaven up. But okay. I remember that. But yeah, it was just, you know, just a great time. I love how we're getting the real story here. And, and uh, you know, close enough, I lived it. I was there. I know. Yeah. You know, that. You you know, know what? Been... Please, please say, say what you're going to say, Kevin. I'm sorry to interrupt. One thing I wanted to go back to, we was talking about, you know, us, me, Derek, Juan, Eddie, creating techno. Now, there was other guys that was right there, too, like um, Blake Baxter, you know? He yeah. He started the crew. He put his first record out on my label. So he was around at the time. San Antonio, who I formed. San Antonio. I said San Antonio. San Antonio. And people yes, were say. I have a record on Eddie's label. Yeah. Oh, on Eddie's. City Boy. Right. When did, right. I got a question for y'all. When did uh Carl uh Carl Craig, Uncle I call him Uncle Carl, when, when <laughs> Black Dracula, uh when did uh Carl Stacy uh Stacy Pullen and um the rest of these guys come come in the game for for you? I know because there's first generation, second generation, third generation. I think I might be fourth or sub fourth or fifth. Right. I don't know where I, where I fit in there. I'd say third. What'd you say, Kevin? Huh? I would say the third generation. What would you say? With Kenny and them? I mean, yeah. Carl. Carl, with Carl and, yeah. and Kenny and everybody. But, well, Carl, uh, Kenny, no, Kenny, Carl, Kenny Larkin. Carl, Carl was second generation. Yeah. Uh, um, Carl, I did when I did in the city, I did this big tour in London. Derek opened up for me as strings of life and Carl was already making music but he was Derek's protege so that had to be like 89 the latest 90 so Carl definitely came at that time and then Stacy was around as I was working on my album I met Stacy they were all around during that time I was and my album came out I think in in 89 as well so they were the next generation, really 89, you know. Uh, and people think Mike Banks is second generation, but he's really first generation. He yeah. didn't remember something else that was on the compilation, but people get confused with you are, which you are, and Jeff Mills, Carl, and all of them came, and uh, Foot, uh, uh, Lenny and Lawrence, 430 West, they all was in that time period. Uh, even Anthony Shakur was first, uh, a yeah. state, first generation. Yeah. Yeah. So people this vision of just me, Derek, and Juan. Yes, it was me, Derek, and Juan because we Belleville three. But then, like, there were other components and other people that was uh, creating at the, exactly at the same time. But Juan was always first, and and Derek had a lot to do with bringing everybody together because everybody I met was actually through Derek. Just about everybody, and Juan wasn't the kind of guy that was meeting people and 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 sharing resources. He just wasn't that kind of guy. So Derek brought everybody together, you know? Um, so, and then you had Thomas Martin was around. He was a musician. I don't know what he was doing there. I know he wrote on um, new photo, but he wasn't like, you know, I, I can't speak a lot about him because he was around, but you know, he was this cat that was making some music, but I wasn't that really connected to him. And I know he made a record with Derek, which was new photo, so. So where do you feel like where Kelly Hand fell in? And what, yeah. what she say? Because I, I was say, with her. That's back to again when I'm talking about the fight of women. I would say second generation, Kelly. Kelly, yeah. 
Kelly is bad. I, I love Kelly. She is, you know, she is an incredible DJ, incredible sweet person. In her house, Acacia Records. It was named after a street. She lived in this little bitty house over the Acacia. That's why the label is named that. Right. Wow. I would say Kelly's second generation, though. You know, for sure. Right there with Carl and them. Well, who's first generation? Juan, Derek, myself, Mike Banks, Anthony Shake, Shakir, um, Blake Baxter, Eddie Folks, San Antonio. So you're basing that on house, I mean, uh, techno. I'm basing, on that. I'm basing that on creating me, <laughs> not DJ wise, but creating. Oh, okay. I'm All right. I'm trying to be now you prior to me when it comes to DJing, you were before me as a DJ. Most of those people, most of all of them was before me as a DJ. But you know, Al, you, Ken, Delano, that whole direct drive, all that. I didn't even really know. I wasn't even connected to the, the direct direct drive side of things. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even know most of those cats. But I know all of y'all. You know, we're DJing Wayne in the mix, Bradley. You know, uh, yeah. I remember him. You know, but that was all kind of the beginning of the support that was playing the music. But nobody was making the music. Juan took the step into making the music. Derek and myself and Eddie Follow, and that kind of put us on another level of creativity as we were becoming DJs. You know, gotcha. okay. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, I, 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 didn't concur, I can concur to that, you know, just saying, you know, when you talk about generational, because it's, you know, yeah. each little piece influenced something. Of course. To continue yeah. for it to go on. And no, I, 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 you know, I figure out, you know, you know, Ken didn't live long enough to make a lot of records, but he did make Will Me Out. And um, just, well, he got this one bastard line and we just freak all the way out, you know, right. on the Black Not Was album, uh, Outcome to Freaks. He did put that out. That was you know, right. production, and so that was prior to you. I I, I love how this distinction actually uh, ha has just came up, and it's really clarified. I think so much in the Detroit uh, timeline, in the sense that, as you said, Kevin, there were a lot of DJs before. However, it was you guys being the catalyst, and and Juan being the catalyst, and making the music that really forged the way to, identi to identify Detroit and the new dance sound of Detroit, which kind of was the invention of techno music. And that's, that's I think, so important for so many people and for historians as well to really understand the tale of both the DJs that influenced techno music and the people who who then created techno music being you, you guys and you know first generation and all these other people that we're talking about i know like the calling card for detroit artists has always been our music you know we've exported so many great and talented artists you know everyone we've been speaking on a show so many people we haven't spoke about moody man later you know um harmony park stuff the great and late uh mike huckabee you know so many great talented musicians we've, we've really been able to put out. I mean, generationally, I mean, without any of you guys, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today being able to host you guys and trying to bring shed some light on the history of, of the city that inspired me and so many around the world. You know, I'm from, I'm from the suburbs, got to put my hands up. You know, I was originally from Kalamazoo, but I, you know, I was down there. Chicago, right? Huh? But I guess you didn't. You weren't here in the house music in Chicago at that time, were you? Probably was too young, I guess. I'm, I'm no, well, I spent my summers in Chicago. My parents have always been in the house music. You know, my you met my my mom and dad, Heather right. and Sherman. You know, and uh, Sherman's Sherman's a DJ, and um, yeah, my mom my mom was going to warehouse and all that stuff back in the day. Going out we from Chicago. We had a big warehouse here. I was the DJ there. Chicago one, the Chicago one, and. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I know. So we, we had moved up. Uh, I had moved up to Lake Orion in uh, 2000 and I started getting into the music scene there. And I started working late uh, shortly after that uh, at Melodies and Memories with, with, with Crazy Gary up there. And, Crazy uh, Gary, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and that's but how I, the one thing that, you know, when you, when you speak about Ken, Derek, and all of us, you know, when we noticed the people in Detroit making that music, we took it. 
we took it and ran it. So we were on bigger platforms here in the city and we played it. It was, it was no question. We, it was, you know, we, we, we was more than happy to do it and, and just doing that. And, and I like the fact when you brought up that deep space, when they did this, uh, these pirate stations and we would run, <laughs> we were yeah. running huh? Cause we could hear this is FM. This is nothing like what the internet is now. Right. So in order for us to hear, we'd have to get in our car and drive to that area. <laughs> So right. we could do music and we would do it faithfully. And it's like, okay, next, and you'd have to relocate every time so he wouldn't get arrested. My my dad told me a lot about that. He's from my stepdad. He he's from Detroit as well, and he's like he's like, yeah, we'd have to go. I'd have to drive the corner of this one place to hear the wizard to hear other people play. <laughs> and me, and my friends would get in the car and go to certain areas just to hear hear on the radio and dance outside the car. Yep. Uh, it's so it's so incredible <laughs> these kind of renegade stories. So many people think, you know, I think when they look at the history of things, think it's a lot more. I mean, yeah, they, they, they just don't understand how ragtag and kind of like just put together a lot of it was you know it's just people who had a real affinity and passion for the music just out here working to create something that they loved and that's what was so so beautiful and organic i think about the creation of the music i i, I know now so many people try to create things and put these big plans together but lacking the passion and and the real drive to you know go forth and do the music it's like even when I got into uh, dance music, it wasn't cool to be into house music. You know, it wasn't something that, you know, you, people did to get famous or popular. I mean, it wasn't until I went to Europe after high school that I even saw people. I didn't even realize you could do this as a job. I was like, oh, man, I'm just used to seeing people, people in the little clubs in Detroit. <laughs> you know, like I went to Europe. I saw thousands of people at a party. I was like, well, this is for real. <laughs> but um, it's it's really interesting to be able to talk to you guys and hear these incredible stories. I know we don't, we're not allowed to have so much time on this show. We gotta, so we gotta keep it to some sort of a wrap up, but with that being some type of closing, I'd like to hear, I mean, we could go on for hours, but I'd like to hear from you guys. If you had anything else you'd like to add to the story or like to have our listeners here um, before we wrap up and then get on to the incredible stat sets from Stacy and Al, uh, who unfortunately w wasn't here today. And uh, yeah, just uh, let people know on a final record of of the uh, the slate of history about Detroit music and and how we got here and where we're going uh, today and tomorrow. Yeah, well, I, I wanna I wanna mention James Pendleton because I forgot to mention him. He's first generation. Suburban Knight, Suburban Knight. Yeah. And people might not know this. He actually went to Belleville High School. So if there was the Belleville Four, he would be the fourth. <laughs> He would be the fourth. No doubt. He went to that. Yeah, he was just two years younger than me, you know, he was here at the same time. That's so important. That's yeah. so important. Well, it is not, well, it is history. You know, I got up Monday morning, what, two or three weeks ago or something like that. And I had no idea that this show was on and uh, where you had uh, Cornel West. Uh, you know, I knew it was coming, but I didn't, it's not like I got up to go hear it. I just yeah. got to get up and turn on and whatever I was working on doing something and, and, turned on Twitch and there it was. And I so loved that um, interview um, with Dr. West. Uh, Thank you so much, yeah. That, that, was, that was just excellent. So um, I actually took it and did some inserts and made a song and stuff and you'll hear it in the mix. Well, you know what, Stacy? They've been talking to me, Dr. West and, uh, and Brandon. You know, they're starting House of West, this, uh, this music label. And uh, we're gonna, I'll be actually reaching out to both of you because they're looking for some artists to do uh to be part of a big collaboration uh officially with dr west and uh some of his works so it's so good to you know obviously dr west means the most and so much to us, so many people in our community and the things he's done so i will i'll on another chat outside of this get back to you yeah, and maybe can, just to me i mean it was just it was just you know just right on point uh, and yeah was, and, and so again I, i'd love you know for me to see the beginnings of, of kevin and and to see what's happening now and just watch the whole entire journey. Um, you know, just my tools go off to me. You know, he allowed, he put out one of my songs on this label right. uh, on camera. So I'm like, yeah. it was an accident. I'm like, how you, <laughs> it was a doctor. And I go places and hear people playing. I'm like, what? So uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, just, just, just say that, you know, you have the whole world to choose from. 
And so, you know, to, to pick me to put one out, I'm just over the moon about it. Um, and uh, and I'm still, I'm getting a lot of play for that uh, the remix that I did. I had Cat Dyson put some guitar on Believe and all that, but I know that that was inner city and it was done, but it's doing extremely well for me for, play, you know, people, because I play it every time. Right. Wherever I'm at, I play it. It's like, oh, and I say what it is, I'm playing it. But this is the song, and this is Detroit. This is homemade. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, you know? So, so just know that uh, you know black music. I love like what he said uh, because all of the people that you talked about, we are all black. Yeah, we, we weren't. Our, we wasn't. We didn't do it because we was black. We was doing it just because we love music. But everyone you mentioned and the collaboration and stuff. This is who and what we are. And this is the way that we set the path. And that's it. I, that's what I want the world to know because they don't realize that this movement and this music was not only born and raised out of the Detroit area, that it affected the world. And it's the truth. And you have a lot of, you know, your billionaire DJs running around and saying they're the ones to do it. And no, they didn't. I'm here to say it. No, they didn't. It's the truth. That's that's why we're here to host host these these incredible series of talks to refocus on the fact that techno music and dance music is is black music and it was a, a form of expression and has been for so many generations a way for us to express again another reinterpretation of soul music. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important, I think, for future generations to hear that. You know, the people of Deport, you know, as much as house music and techno music's been gentrified and changed and has in some ways lost some of its soul, you know, it's also brought beautiful people together. And, you know, we're not trying to make it a segregation issue out of this at all. Yeah. But it's just, it's just so important, I think, for the viewers and everybody to understand and hear these real stories and to hear um, the history of how we got here and the beautiful tales amongst these friendships and um and so many uh and and a little bit of the shade too i mean i wish al was on here we could have got some real shade out of him we were like, oh my god i was looking forward to that because we really <laughs> pull off each other really a lot I, I was really looking forward to al too al, al worked with me down there with crazy i worked with al down there with crazy garrett with crazy uh, uh with gary gary coral down at melodies and memories yeah. for a He's long time so you can play three beats you remember every record over five decades yeah, I've always, I'm you know, always came out of that, that. I'm just more like, like for real. <laughs> wow, it's so incredible. But thank you guys so much for joining. I know Kevin, you got a new inner city record that just came out. Still doing right. it to it, like there ain't nothing to it. Um, so uh, yeah, everybody, please check it out. The generational uh, generations continue. Dantes and the boys are all out there bringing yeah. on the next generation of the Saundersons. So we got more techno and more generations of Detroit bred artists to come. And I'm so and uh, happy. Uh -huh. well, yeah. Music too. Yeah, and Stacy got some new tracks coming we out too. Up, but it's very, very seriously house here as well. You know, we, we looked at it as the home of techno, but we play house music. We play a lot, of, it's, a, it's some excellent house music created there. You I mean, there was so much of the story that was was <laughs> talking about actually. You know, not uh, that, but somehow it gets overlooked a little. You know, Patrice Scott and some of the stuff what they put out like so much, so much, so many people we didn't get to mention today. I'm actually going to take this moment to let the viewers know I'm starting a a, a Twitch channel of my own in uh in April called Dream Access TV, where I'll be continuing the, continuing these interviews and getting deeper into the stories of of dance music and giving more time than we have uh, currently to kind of really showcase all these incredible um, kind of, yeah, all these incredible real stories between peers and artists and um, and tell you guys the real history behind what dance music is and, um, and just continue this rich tradition in the way that I experienced it and that so many of you guys created for us. It's so um, incredible, such an incredible privilege to be able to talk to both of you and to be both friends and peers of you. And I'm just so happy to be here with you, Kevin. Thank you so much. And Stacy, thank you so much for giving us your time on the, on this day. I mean, really, I, I am uh, beyond beyond thankful to be able to be here and talk with you guys about this, and like a little school kid, be able to hear these stories. Jeez, she's so man, wow, wow, man. The baby, I'm like, ooh. As I said, that was that was that was real right, right there. <laughs>
<laughs> like, <laughs> Thank, thanks for having me. And uh, you're gonna, it's going to be more in the future. You know, we, we got the first family of techno, which is my boys, their mother and me. We're working on a project together. And we are, you know, there's nobody can say there's a family like ours working on music and, that, and it's putting out music that's that's coming. And uh, that's I, beautiful. I, I, that's I, great. I, I, and I have a book coming soon, my own book about Ooh. that same stuff we've been talking about. It's coming. Very you soon. heard it here first. The first book, the first yeah. book from the first family. That's that's incredible. That's All beautiful. Right. That's beautiful. Keep it going, Kevin. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Stacy. Right. God bless you all. And I, I hope I appreciate this so much. I really do. I appreciate it. It was, uh, you yeah. know, it's, it's that it, that um, you decided to do this and, and who you selected. Yeah, you were one of the top on our list. I was like, we gotta get Stacy on here to let her, let them know they're gonna learn today. That's <laughs> what I said. I was like, I was like, we gotta get these. We can get them on. We gotta let, we gotta teach the children mm -hmm. the truth of what was going on out here. <laughs> All right. Thank you all, and good good night, good evening to y'all. Thank you so much. I'll speak right. to you soon. All okay. Right, take care. What's up on the chat? <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care.